Hey guys, uh, this next video series is basically going to deal with the, the brain, um, what you have to know for the test about the brain, uh, both the structure and the function, the various components of it. Um, this is a brain right here that I have, a little model of a brain that I have right here. You can see this upper portion of the brain, we call this the cerebrum, that's right here. This is where all your thought and reasoning is at. So all your thought and reasoning is located up in the cerebrum. Remember, we break the cerebrum down into lobes. This is where we get the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe, the parietal lobe, and the occipital lobe. Down here, right over here, sorry, right here, um, this structure right here that I have right here, this is called the cerebellum. This is where all your balance and posture, uh, muscle coordination is located at us in this little area of the brain here. As I move down here, I see this little structure right here. This structure right here, this is your brain stem that's right here. That's where all your vital functions are located at. If I take the brain and I open up the brain and I take a look at it right here, these structures are all located right in here. This is called your diencephalon um, that we have there. Um, this is going to control things like various hormones are produced here. Cerebral spinal fluid is produced in these particular areas that are here. Um, also, this acts as a relay station for sensory neurons um, to be able to send information to the correct location that's there. You can also see part of your brainstem um, down in here. You can see the brainstem. Is uh, right here is your brain stem. So you can see your brain stem's all um, sitting right in this particular area here, and that's where your vital functions are located at um, with the with the brain uh, itself. So like I just said, guys, we just went over the major parts of the brain itself. Uh, we went over the the cerebrum, the diencephalon, and the brain stem and the cerebellum. Those are the fa four major parts of the brain um, that we're going to be talking about uh, today. Again, you can see here's the cerebrum that's up here. This is where all your thought and reasoning is located at. Your cerebellum is back here. That's that balance and posture and muscle coordination. Right here, this little thing that looks like a turkey neck right here. A little turkey right here. You can see that's called your diencephalon. And then your brainstem is kind of the neck of the turkey. The brainstem is going to fuse in with the spinal cord. So take a look at the cerebrum. Um, the cerebrum is divided into a hemispheres, the right and the left hemisphere. Um, it includes more than half of the brain's mass, so the majority of your brain is, 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 held in play, is, uh, is composed of that cerebrum. Um, and remember, when we take a look at the, the surface of the cerebrum itself, it has these ridges and grooves. Okay, these ridges are called gyri. On your test, I expect you to be able to identify gyri on the brain that you have. So you can see here on this diagram that I have these little ridges that we have, these ridges that I have on here. If I'm pointing to a ridge, this is a ridge right here. These are ridges. These ridges are called gyri. These grooves, okay, these little indentations, these grooves that we have here, okay, are called sulcuses. So you have gyri and you have sulcuses. Um, gyri are the ridges, sulcuses or sulci, you also hear them called as well, are the grooves. Um, and basically what they're there for is they're going to increase the surface area of the cerebrum so that more neurons can be held in those particular areas itself. Um, remember, your brain does shrink over time as you begin to age and stuff like that. Um, so those gyri and sulcuses will kind of shrink down in size as well, um, and your brain won't be able to hold as much information that it, uh, or much content or, or neurons that it once did as you begin to age. You can see here's the gyri that are right here, okay, and then the sulci or sulcuses um, are these grooves that are here. Now, if it's a very deep, 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 deep groove, we call it a fissure. So if it's a deep groove in the cerebrum, um, that's what we call a fissure. Notice when we take a look at the cerebrum, we, die, we, we break it down into different lobes. So you have the frontal lobe, okay, which is the front portion of the brain. This area back here is called the parietal lobe. All the way in the back you have the occipital lobe, and then you have the temporal lobe. So those are the four major lobes of the cerebrum that you have. Um, when you take a look at it on your test, you're going to have to be able to identify the four major lobes of the, uh, of the cerebrum as well. So we take a look here. We talk, just talk about the fissures being the deep grooves that divide um, the cerebrum into different lobes. The major lobes that we have are the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe. This is a, what a brain looks like in real life, and you can kind of see um, where the different lobes are at in this particular image. When we take a look at these different lobes, they have different areas that are of significance. When we take a look at the uh, the, the parietal lobe, the parietal lobe contains an area that's called the primary somatic sensory area. And this is going to receive impulses from the body's sensory receptors. So things like, uh, like pain, uh, pressure, 
um, temperature. This is all going to be received in this particular area of the brain. It's located on the front of the parietal lobe. So on the front of the parietal lobe, I have this area that's called the primary somatic sensory area. So when I take a look, let me see if I have another image that's a little bit better than that one that I just showed you right here. But right here is your primary somatic sensory area right here. It's on the front of the parietal lobe. On the front of the parietal lobe is this primary somatic sensory area that's here. When I take a look at the back of the frontal lobe, the back of the frontal lobe contains the primary motor area that's here. And this is where all your motor coordination as far as stimulating different muscles and things like that, coordinating these muscles um, in order to become active. This is where this is going to be controlled at as this primary motor area. So you can see very two important areas we have are the primary somatic sensory area, which is in the parietal lobe, the front of the parietal lobe, then the back of the frontal lobe contains the primary motor area. And this is what's going to send outgoing information to these skeletal muscles um, in order for them to be able to fire up, um, whether it be your quadriceps, your hamstrings, your bicep, all these muscles that we've talked about um, in the past is, is what it's going to, to take a, a look at. We also have an area um, that's called Broca's area that's kind of towards, the, uh, towards this area on the frontal lobe um, that I'll show you here in the next picture. Um, and this is going to be involved in our ability to have our motor speech. This is Broca's area that's hanging out right here is Broca's area. So physically being able to have this motor speech um, as to what you're saying and physically say it, um, this is Broca's area. So Broca's area is the physical motor movement to create your speech is what it's going to do. And that's located in the, uh, in the front below. You can see, guys, this image here that I'm showing you right here, this is going to uh, basically... Um, show you what areas of the brain uh, are being controlled by, by, by what um, as far as the motor cortex and the sensory cortex are concerned. These are called homunculus. And basically it's an upside down human being on that portion of the brain. So you look at the motor cortex, you can see a ton of space on that motor cortex is dedicated to the movement of, of facial muscles that are here. As well as when you take a look at the sensory cortex, you can see a lot of you have a lot of sensory uh, information is gathered from your face as well. Look at the lips that are here. You can see they have a ton of sensory um, dedication to them uh, as far as the, the area is concerned on your, um, on your sensory cortex of, the, uh, of the, uh, the parietal lobe that's there. Your fingers as well have a lot of sensory receptors um, that you can see. But you can see the amount of area that's dedicated on the motor cortex and the sensory cortex to these different areas of the, uh, of the body. Other areas that we have that are kind of important when you look at the temporal lobe, um, temporal lobe is going to control two things. The temporal lobe is going to control your auditory, um, has an auditory area, and it also controls your ability to hear. And then the temporal lobe also has an olfactory area, which is your ability to smell. Your occipital lobe is going to control vision. So the occipital lobe has a visual area that is there. Um, taste is located towards the bottom of that parietal on that sensory cortex is where we kind of find that uh, the gustoris area as far as taste is concerned. On your test, you can put for gustoris area, you can put temporal, or you can put uh, parietal as well, and I'll give you credit for either one of those. Um, these areas here, I'm not going to expect you to know on the test as far as speech, language, region, language, comprehension, general interpretation area. I just don't have enough time um, to go over those in detail. The content that you have to know is already sufficient enough uh, to that you have to know a lot of information. So this slide you can kind of skip. Again, another image of the brain. I've given you these images time and time and time again. Um, you can see here's your taste area right here at the bottom of the parietal, almost towards the temporal. Again, Broca's area is right here is on the frontal. Um, we've talked about the olfactory area on the temporal lobe that's here. And then you can see over here, this is the auditory area that's located right here on the temporal. And then your visual areas right back here on the occipital. Those are important things that you have to know as well on your test as far as identification is concerned. When we take a look inside the brain, you're going to see gray matter and you're going to see white matter. Anytime I see gray matter, gray matter is indicative that there's a whole bunch of cell bodies that are located in that given area. White matter is indi indicative of uh, an area of heavy myelination. So this is an area that has a, a lot of axons are in that particular area because these axons are heavily myelinated. Um, we take a look at it. There's a specific area deeper than the brain that we call the corpus callosum, um, and it's going to connect the two hemispheres of them. 
Um, sometimes in the brain you'll see islands of gray matter buried within this white matter, and we call those basal nuclei. The next area I'm going to talk about is called the diencephalon. And this area kind of confuses a lot of students, um, but it's not that confusing of an area. The diencephalon is just this area that's right here. Okay, it's just this area that I have right here is what we call the diencephalon. And the diencephalon consists of the hypothalamus, so everything in purple in this image right here is the hypothalamus. Then you have this circular-like structure right here that is called the thalamus. So the roof of the hypothalamus is called the thalamus, okay? And then this structure right here is called the epithalamus that you have right here. So these are the three major components of the diencephalon is you have the hypothalamus, the thalamus, and then you have the epithalamus that's right here. This thing that hangs off the hypothalamus right here becomes important when we talk about the endocrine system. This gland that's hanging off right here is called the pituitary gland. Um, interesting thing about the hypothalamus, the hypothalamus contains both nervous tissue and glandular tissue for the endocrine system. So this is, um, this is an area that's right here that contains both this nervous tissue and also glandular tissue or endocrine tissue um, as well. That's an interesting thing about the hypothalamus that's there. But I'm going to talk a little bit about what these structures actually do. Um, interesting thing, back on the back of this epithalamus, you have an area called the pineal body, um, which is part of the epithalamus. That's where melatonin is produced. Um, that helps regulate your day-night cycles as far as sleeping is concerned. Again, another picture here of the diencephalon. You can see the structure here in red um, is the diencephalon. So here's the three parts that we just talked about. It's called the, th the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. Again, another picture that you can see. The first thing we want to talk a little bit about is when we look at the thalamus itself. The thalamus contains a relay station for sensory impulses, is what it does. It kind of acts like an operator, and it's going to send these correct sensory impulses to where they need to go on the brain. So this is the thalamus that's right here, and it's going to coordinate where the sensory information has to go into the brain. That's the major function of the thalamus, is coordinating the sensory activity to the correct location of the cerebrum. So it's going to transfer impulses to the correct cortex for localization and uh, interpretation. That's a major job of the thalamus. The hypothalamus is what sits under the thalamus. It's going to regulate your body temperature. It controls your water balance. It also helps regulate metabolism. It does this in a variety of ways. One of the major ways that it's able to do this is it produces some hormones uh, like vasopressin. Um, it, it, it produces some thyroid hormones as well, thyroid, uh, thyroid releasing hormones or thyroid, sorry, um, but it produces uh, thyroid secreting hormones, uh, thyroid releasing hormones, I'm sorry, um, as well as vasopressin are the hormones that it produces. Um, you don't have to know these hormones, guys, until we get into the, uh, to the endocrine, endocrine system as well. It's also going to regulate your body temperature is what the hypothalamus does. Hypothalamus is also important to the limbic system. Remember, the limbic system is a, an important part of your uh, emotional control center, so like your sexual desires, your thirst, your hunger, um, happiness, sadness, um, depression, all these things are controlled by the limbic system. And we said earlier that the pituitary gland is attached to the hypothalamus itself. The epithalamus is going to form the roof um, of the thalamus, and it, contr it contains the pineal body, which is an endocrine gland that produces, um, that produces melatonin, which is going to regulate your day-night cycles. Um, and then it's also going to con uh, contain the choroid plexus, the epithalamus is what's going to make that cerebral spinal fluid, um, which is a protective component of your actual brain itself. It helps maintain the actual, uh, keeps your brain in place, is what the cerebral spinal fluid does. Um, and the last lecture that I gave you, um, lecture four, um, went over the, uh, the importance of that cerebral spinal fluid. As we move down, well, let's just make sure that we have this all squared away as to where these areas are located at because a lot of you guys get confused as to where these areas are located. Again, right here is the hypothalamus. This in purple is the hypothalamus that's right here. This is going to control your body temperature. Um, it's also part of the limbic system. Um, it's also going to uh, control uh, your water balance inside of your body as well as controlled in this hypothalamus that is here. This structure right here is your thalamus. Your thalamus acts like a relay station. 
uh, for these sensory impulses. And this their structure right here, this is your epithalamus, this right here, and your epithalamus is going to produce cerebral spinal fluid, also contains the pineal body, um, which is going to produce melatonin. We're going to move down now to this structure right here, and all these structures right here are your brain stem. So this is your brain stem that's located here. Your brain stem consists of the midbrain, the pons, and then the part that fuses with the spinal cord is called the medulla oblongata. So the parts of the brain stem are the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. Those are the three parts of the brain stem. The midbrain is mostly composed of tracts. Anytime we talk about tracts, they're heavily myelinated areas of the, uh, of the brain itself. Um, but the major thing that the midbrain controls is it's a reflex center for vision and hearing. So this is where your reflexes are controlled as far as vision is concerned. Remember that pupillary reflex that we talked about is going to be controlled in this midbrain that we have. The pons is that circular-like structure that I identified earlier. Um, this is one of the major things that it controls. It's going to regulate breathing. So it has a breathing component to it that's going to regulate breathing. So the pons helps regulate breathing. And then the medulla oblongata has a lot of functions that are associated with it as far as your vital functions. Um, and it's going to control things like your heart rate, your blood pressure, your breathing, your ability to swallow, and your ability to vomit. So these four things, four, three, four things are all controlled in that medulla oblongata. So we have the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. Embedded within the brainstem as well, you have an area that contains a ton of gray matter. Remember, gray matter is going to clue us in that this area has a ton of cell bodies that are located in there. And this is where all we have all our motor control of our visceral organs. Um, so how I control my the movement of my digestive system, uh, all these vital, vital organs that I have in my body, the motor control is controlled by them. Um, by this particular formation. It also is going to help regulate our consciousness as well as well as sleeping and waking as well. But this area is located as well in the brainstem that I'm showing you right here. This is this reticular formation that's going to help control um, the visceral um, organ movement and things like that are going to be controlled. This is kind of part of your autonomic nervous system that you really don't have conscious control over. I mean, you're not consciously sitting there thinking about digestive system move, digestive system move, peristalsis of the esophagus, these different types of things um, you're not consciously thinking about. But the reticular formation is one of these areas of the brainstem that's going to help control um, those vital functions that we have. Um, we did some labs as well that dealt with reflexes. Um, remember, a reflex is a rapid, predictable, involuntary response to a stimuli. And it occurs over pathways that we call reflex arcs. A reflex arc is going to go from a sensory neuron to an inner neuron to a motor neuron to an effector. It doesn't always include an inner neuron. Um, when you guys did that patellar tendon reflex, it went right from a sensory neuron to a motor neuron. Um, but these are going to be just rapid, predictable, involuntary. You don't have conscious thought over them. Um, this can be a response to a stimuli. A lot of times, these reflexes are going to be there for protective purposes. Um, we take a look at the withdrawal reflex. It could be preventing your hand from getting burned. We take a look at the gag reflex. It's going to prevent you from um, choking and helping you maintain homeostasis is what it's going to do. That patellar reflex can help keep you upright um, is what it can do. But these are basically going to be very predictable. They occur over pathways we call a reflex arc. This is an example of a reflex arc that we have here. Um, let's say that you, you step on something or your hand hits something that's relatively sharp. If your hand were to continue to go through that, you'd cut yourself. But because you have this reflex, it goes from a sensory neuron right to an inner neuron in the spinal cord. And rather go inner neuron, inner neuron, inner neuron, all the way up to your brain to get processed, it comes right out of that spinal cord via motor neuron out to that effector where you can pull your hand away from that situation. Like I said, guys, not all these reflexes arcs are going to go right to an inner neuron. In this case here, um, with the patellar reflex that we worked on in class, it goes right from a sensory neuron. It's going to synapse right with a motor neuron, and that's going to cause your leg to, uh, to kick out. With the withdrawal reflex, it goes from a sensory neuron to an inner neuron, and then it goes out to a motor um, neuron itself where your hand's going to be withdrawn. When I take a look at these guys, the less synapses that you have, the quicker your response time is going to be. So the less synapses that I have, the quicker your response time is going to be. We did a whole variety of labs as well that dealt with reaction time 
And uh, our reaction time, the more complex the task was, the longer it took to take. And the reason the longer it took to take is because there's more synapses involved in the process. If there's more thinking required, there's more synapses. If there's more synapses, the longer event it takes. Um, so if you just have a one synapse, a monosynaptic event, that's going to happen relatively quickly because you only have to exchange information one particular time. Somatic reflex are going to activate skeletal muscle. Um, the withdrawal reflex is going to be an example of a somatic reflex. The patellar reflex is an example of a uh, somatic reflex. The opposite of a somatic reflex is an autonomic reflex. An autonomic reflex is going to be smooth muscle regulation. Um, this can be things like your uh, activation um, of your iris. Your pupillary reflex would be an example of smooth muscle um, regulation that we have. Um, peristalsis would be another example that we have. The movement, the churning of our stomach contents, is different types of things is going to be the smooth muscle regulation that we have as an autonomic re, uh, reflex as well. It's also going to uh, regulate your heart and blood pressure um, as well as regulation of glands that we have. I talked about the digestive system regulation that's controlled by autonomic um, reflexes. We dealt with the uh, autonomic and the somatic um, divisions of our nervous system, so we kind of have an idea as to what these are as well. But here's an example of a tire reflex being used on this little kid here uh, who's getting hit um, with that hammer. Um, and then that, uh, that's a monosynaptic event because it's just going from a, uh, from a sensory neuron to a motor neuron, then out to the effector itself, which is the uh, skeletal muscle that caused that leg to kick out. That final component of the brain is the cerebellum. The cerebellum um, is going to provide involuntary coordination of body movements. Um, so this is, uh, it's going to control the smoothness of how you're moving um, through a given area. It's controlling your balance and posture. But, so when my leg kicks out, then my arm comes out and it follows. This kind of precise type of movement that you have is all coordinated by the cerebellum. Um, remember, alcohol has a great effect on the cerebellum. Um, those individuals that have to undergo a sobriety test and things like that, um, they make them do a variety of things like walking a line, those different types of things and stuff like that. Alcohol has a severe effect uh, on the cerebellum itself. So hopefully, guys, that kind of gave you a, a brief introduction into the brain itself. Um, just remember those components of the brain, the gyri, the salsi, um, the different lobes of the cerebrum, um, and then uh, those different parts of the diencephalon and the brainstem itself. Um, just kind of go over this time and time again. There will be a diagram on your test over the brain. I would study that extensively uh, so you kind of know those given areas. Again, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask me any questions um, in class. I wish you the best of luck as you prepare to study for the test.